I want to tell you a story of Elon Musk and why he is the way that he is. But it's actually a story about his grandfather, Joshua N. Handelman. Like me, Handelman lived in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Unlike me, Handelman was a technocrat. Now today, people use that word to describe obtuse policy wonks or centrist Democrats. Basically, it's a political slur. Nobody actually calls themselves a proud technocrat. But Handelman did. He was literally part of a political movement called Technocracy Incorporated, and he was head of the Canadian chapter. Handelman and Technocracy Incorporated hoped to turn North America into a continent-wide technate. This was to be a techno-utopia governed by science and expertise. Handelman's movement was led by a mysterious figure named Howard Scott. There's not a lot known about his uh, background, and he, he was a bit of a fabulist in the sense that he made up stuff about himself. He created Technocracy Incorporated in 1933 and led it until he died in 1970. And he was both his biggest asset and his biggest liability. This is Ira Basin, a radio documentarian that works at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. He produced an excellent CBC Ideas documentary on this very subject. It's called Welcome to the Technate. We called him up to ask him about what he learned. Ira tells us that Howard Scott was this eccentric, imposing figure. I'm talking 6'5". He stood out and he really knew how to command a room. And this really comes across when you listen to him. He was a great speaker. He had a great deep voice because he was a chain smoker and chain smokers often have, you know, it's kind of cruel that way, um, often have great voices for radio. Now, as far as technocracy's ideas are concerned, we're so far left that we make communism look bourgeois. Scott's radical claim was that engineers should run society. And like any good engineer, he presented his claim in the most technical of terms. He made technocracy seem natural and inevitable. He was clearly very smart, not as smart as he thought he was, but he was a very smart guy, could ream off like facts and figures, was apparently trained as an engineer. It was really an inspiring vision, in some ways. They wanted to throw out capitalism and install a more rational political order. They promised everyone a life of plenty, and they were making this promise when things couldn't have been further from that reality. This was the Great Depression. So they looked around, as many people did in the 1930s, and said, what's wrong here? Like, why, how could this possibly be happening when we have so much wealth and so much abundance, and look at how much poverty and homelessness and devastation and hunger there is? And their answer was that the economic system and the political system had not made the shift from scarcity to abundance. Howard Scott thought that we humans hadn't made really much progress at all until the Industrial Revolution. And the way that he measured progress was through energy. That's what he based his entire political theory on. It was literally an energy theory of politics. And it asked a simple question. Could humans produce more energy than they consumed? Scott said that for the vast majority of our history, we couldn't. But now, we were getting there. Remember that we stated years ago that when the producing mechanism in the United States, on or before it, the consumption of extraneous energy, reached 200,000 kilogram calories per capita per day, that when it reached that, the majority of healthy, able-bodied citizens would no longer be required to produce and distribute the physical wealth of this continent. Yet, this wealth wasn't coming. Even though the technology was there, the problem was that the political system wasn't lined up with that technology. It's only a question of time, and a very short time at that. Because uh, every new advance on the technical field is producing more and more with less and less. And how are you going to distribute the great production of abundance of this technological complex to a social system that is back in the days of George Washington. That's the problem. 
and they cannot meet it under this system. These ideas really took shape for Scott around 1918. He was a bohemian living in Greenwich Village, and he got in with some famous intellectuals. One of those intellectuals was named Thorsten Veblen, and Veblen's ideas transfixed Scott. Veblen was this iconoclastic economist who coined a number of memorable concepts. Concepts like conspicuous consumption and conspicuous waste. Anytime you're condemning the rich for their frivolity and their wastefulness, you're probably using some words that Veblen came up with. Honestly, there's a lot I like about Veblen, but he's kind of weird. He's an idiosyncratic thinker. His revolutionary theory certainly is not a Marxist one. It's not focused on workers versus the ruling class. It's much more focused on certain psychosocial pathologies of specific elites and specific institutions, like the corporation. Veblen looked closely at the top companies and he saw a conflict between the financial and the industrial elites. Basically, this was lazy owners versus industrious engineers. Veblen said that the owners wanted to just maximize profits, so to do that, they cut back production. But the hardworking engineers were completely different. And so he came up with this idea that, in fact, rather than venerate kind of businessmen and politicians, that engineers would be kind of the vanguard of the new society. Veblen proposed a very strange concept, the Soviet of engineers. He gave engineers advice on how they could overthrow the current social and political order. Which was a kind of a, an odd sort of concept and one that not many engineers themselves bought into. This idea of the cult of the engineer kind of originated with Veblen, and this was really the kind of foundation for technocracy. Scott took Veblen's ideas and built a circle of technocratic intellectuals. They called themselves the Technical Alliance, and they were based at Columbia University. This was kind of a research group, and they hoped to chart the entire U.S. industrial system. Scott did a lot of this kind of work, and it really excited people, including the international workers of the world. He became the chief evangelist for technocracy, and honestly, he was a pretty good one. In the early 1930s, technocrats routinely got glowing press coverage. They even got more features than FDR did at the time. This is according to William Atkins' book, Technocracy and the American Dream. Basically, very briefly, Technocracy was the darling of progressive intellectuals, journalists, and policy elites. It was the most exciting idea of the time, even though it was a very radical idea. What they saw as the central problem was what they called the price system. And at the root of the price system was money, money that was not rooted in anything, right? It was essentially a, a social convention that everybody agreed, okay, this dollar is worth so much. Scott proposed a radical new currency. The currency, which was not called money, but was called energy certificates, would be based on how much energy went into producing something. After you've determined how much energy there is within the technate, then you divide that by the number of people who live within the technate, and that gives you the number of energy certificates that you have to distribute. And you distribute them equally to everybody over the age of 25. This was a technologically enabled vision of perfect equality. And it turns out, didn't require that much labor, right? So in the technate, you wouldn't join the labor force until you're 25 years old. Then you'd retire when you were 45. In the meantime, you'd only have to work 16 hours a week and you'd get 78 days of vacation. There's a catch though. This is not a democracy. It is a straightforward meritocracy. Scott's slogan was government by science, social control through the power of technique. This puts the most intelligent experts in charge. So if you're not one of them, you are going to lose some freedoms. But Scott insisted that this trade was worth it. The most common fear of the American people is having their freedom of losing their freedom. How will technocracy compensate us in individual liberty? 
Well, what freedom have you got if you haven't got the economic wherewithal to go with it? However, when journalists started to look closer into Scott, they found out that he wasn't exactly who he said he was. He didn't have much technical training. He did run a factory at one point, but he was actually fired for incompetence. He also didn't have the best personality. He gave this famous radio address in 1933, but it ended very poorly. When the crowd started peppering him with difficult questions, he completely lost his temper and just refused to answer. This was a huge embarrassment for the movement. But Scott's biggest weakness was not his technical bona fides or even his personality. It was his political theory of change. Even though he predicted radical technological change, he offered no radical political program to get you there. He thought, if you let nature take its course, technocracy will just inevitably come about. The technocrats then, all they have to do is research to prepare for this inevitable transition. This incensed Veblen and the other technocrats. They wanted a political program. Scott just refused to give them one. And incidentally, this was all happening at the very same time there was a radical new political program being offered, the New Deal. A prompt program applied as quickly as possible seemed to me not only justified, but imperative to our national security. The, Congress the New Deal was like technocracy light. FDR famously had an expert brain trust. He embraced radical progressive reformers and he flexed the muscles of government planning to lift the U.S. out of the Great Depression. First, we are giving opportunity of employment to a quarter of a million of the unemployed, especially the young men who have dependents, to let them go into fight. But FDR also knew a thing or two about political organizing and political persuasion. He mobilized against the financial elites and he encouraged labor organizing. His administration even produced impressive propaganda and created lavish buildings and radical artistic production. He basically brought technocratic ideas and populist ones together. For some technocrats, this was an opportunity, albeit an imperfect one, but still an opportunity. For others, it was simply a perversion. When Roosevelt became president of the United States and brought in the New Deal, uh, some of the people that were involved in the technical alliance went to the New Deal because they thought that they could, you know, make changes, and Howard Scott wasn't interested in any of that. It's not only the New Deal. Some technocrats also form different technocratic organizations, one with a more compelling political vision. Or they turn to Upton Sinclair's Socialist Party. It's a total splintering. But Scott holds the course. And so they went off, and he was left and started this organization called Technocracy Incorporated in, in 1933 and led it for the rest of his life. Technocracy Inc. becomes a quasi-social slash research group. But the splintering had done its damage. That very same year, 1933, the press declares that technocracy is dead. It definitely gets supplanted by FDR and later by World War II. Then you have the post-war boom and enormous economic growth. In that context, people just sort of forget about technocracy. Life was good, right? And then you get to the 1960s, and Scott is still out there preaching technocracy. But in the 1960s, there were lots of other like protest movements that were going on that he really wasn't all that relevant anymore. And he died on New Year's Day, 1970. And... You know, one of the problems that they had is that he had no interest in training anybody to succeed him. And so when he died, they really had nobody to pick up the reins. And they've been a, you know, kind of a weird little rump organization ever since. But they do still exist. Our producer, Mark Apollonio, reached out to Technocracy Inc.'s youngest board member, Parker Duby. He's a PhD student in bioengineering. And just like the OG technocrats, what he mostly does is research. All technocrats should study technocracy continuously. And so it's not just about going through the fundamental texts like the study course or the words and wisdom of Howard Scott, things of that nature. Basically, when I say study technocracy, it's not just that, but you also have to study everything that's currently going on uh, around the world all the time. And so I'm studying everything from uh, Native American culture to nuclear engineering sometimes. Uh, trying to gather a Doobie says that recruiting new members is tough because the concepts are very complex. So he acknowledges 
Technocracy Inc. is currently in a lull. However, I see that as we see more and more economic disparity, economic problems, economic woes, you know, it'll be what occurred during the Great Depression. Individuals will start go looking for possible solutions to what they perceive as problems and will be one of the top. Which brings me back to Saskatchewan. Weirdly, for reasons I can't quite explain, it seems that technocracy held on the longest in Western Canada. Like I said before, Joshua N. Handelman was the Canadian head of Technocracy Inc. Remember, Handelman is Elon Musk's grandfather. Handelman left the group during World War II because Technocracy Inc. agreed that the U.S. should collaborate with the Soviet Union in the fight against fascism. Handelman just did not approve of that because he was so staunchly anti-communist. After that, he turned even more rightward. Handelman joined the Social Credit Party. That party follows the principles of C.H. Douglas, and guess what he does for a living? An engineer. Their social credit idea is basically handing out money. It was a kind of proto-UBI. I think of it as a less radical version of technocracy's energy certificates. But social credit gave technocratic ideas a new kind of spin. They weren't just engineers, they were social conservatives. It was like a party of religious right-wing populists. And they ended up being very anti-communist, pro-eugenics, anti-labor, and full of anti-Semites. But their pitch actually worked better than technocracies ever did. In 1935, they formed government in the Canadian province of Alberta. They stayed in power there in one form or another until 1971. Handelman never did land a seat in government, though. He eventually gave up on his efforts with social credit, and he left Canada entirely. He thought it was becoming too socialist and too immoral. So he moved to the most moral place on earth, apartheid South Africa. He became an aviator and an adventurer, and he spent the rest of his days flying around looking for a legendary lost city. That's according to his obit in the Journal of the Canadian Chiropractic Association. He never did find that city. He died in a plane crash when Elon Musk was three years old. The parallels here are pretty obvious. On the one hand, you have Joshua Handelman, the right-wing aviator, and on the other, you have Elon Musk, the right-wing space adventurer. Elon has texted that he, you know, he's, he's big on going to Mars and wants to not just go there, but colonize and set up a city of a million people and has referred to it as a Martian technate. It was not clear what he meant by that. Still, Ira Basin says that Scott wouldn't have made much of Musk because Musk is an arch-capitalist, not a true technocrat. And that is true, but I think maybe that's too static a definition of technocracy. Maybe there's something in Handelman's ideas that might lead one to Musk. Because often technocrats become disillusioned when people just don't follow their scientific theory of politics. Then they try to force the issue. Maybe they do that by turning to state capitalism, like the New Deal technocrats did. Or maybe they turn harder to the right, like Handelman did. Or maybe, as we'll see later, they become technocratic capitalists. The real point is this. Technocracy is not a left or right thing, a pro-capitalism or anti-capitalism thing. Really, it's a way of seeing politics. Technocrats think that regular people need expert managers. Technocracy Inc. was one extreme manifestation of this thinking, but there are different versions all across the ideological spectrum. In fact, I bet there's a bit of it in you. If you're watching this video or if you listen to our podcast, there's a good chance you're college educated and you know there's a more rational way to organize our society. Maybe sometimes you think if we just put the smart people in charge to take care of that, as long as they had my politics, we'd be totally okay. That's the allure of technocracy. It's very seductive. And that's why this series of episodes is going to cover technocracies, back to back to back. We are traveling through technocracies past, present, and future, left, right, and somewhere in between. We start our journey with Professor Noam Chomsky. That video is next. Next.